New Year's resolutions. We have reached that time. We have celebrated together as family and as friends the whole world over the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now as an American nation, we are about to celebrate and truly give thanks to God for the coming of a new year. And New Year's resolutions is something that just about each and every American sets as goals in order to grow and to mature and to become better and onward and upward, as we say. Some of the most common New Year's resolutions that we make are losing weight, quit smoking, and exercising more. Looking at it from a spiritual point of view, many of us have made resolutions like, this year I'm going to go to church more. I'm going to try to be more spiritual. I'm going to try to volunteer more of my time to a charity. But do we follow through with our New Year's resolutions? Not really. Statistics show us that one in three New Year's resolutions are broken in the first week. The, the, this British study found that one in seven New Year's resolutions fail on January 1st, hours, before we, uh, hours after we made them. So more often than not, we seem to fall short and revert back to our old way of living. What keeps us from fulfilling these noble and good habits? Psychologists agree that in order for us to accomplish our resolutions, we must focus on realistic goals with measurable expectations. In this way, we can break things down into small, manageable steps. The experts say, for existence, don't try to lose 10 pounds in a week or quit smoking cold turkey with no preparation. Instead, try joining a weight loss program and try to lose a pound a week, they say. Or join a smoking cessation group. So we see the experts' advice, advice, advice as follows. Realistic goals with measurable results through established programs and groups. So there's a strategy for growth. This good and sound advice offered by these experts and psychologists is hardly a new concept though. Realistic goals with measurable results is another way of saying orthopraxia, I'm sorry, orthodoxia with orthopraxia. Right and true teachings with good and measurable acts and results. Correct thinking with correct action. This is the life of the Orthodox Church for the past 2,000 years. Correct thinking with correct action. The proof that the Orthodox Church is successful in her mission are the lives of the saints. They are the people in whom Christ lives, one who opens his life to Christ and lives as the Lord wants him to live. They live together. By giving their lives to Christ, they have conquered sin. They've washed away every impurity of their body and their spirit. And you and I and every other person in this world are called to be a saint. Through our baptism, we have died to the attraction and the cravings of sin and have put on Christ, which brings about love and holiness in our lives. So losing weight, quit smoking, and exercising more, become more spiritual. Doing more for others are nothing more than ways in which we seek to improve ourselves. We see what we are, what we look like, and we want to change because we know this isn't the real me. We have unlimited potential, both as a person and as a people. Yet this improvement, this growth, this transformation that we are seeking for ourselves requires additional resources and additional support. We need new strength. We need new guidance. 
We cannot do it alone. This is precisely the reason why we fail to fulfill our resolutions and then are overcome again by our sinful bad habits, whatever they may be. We try to do it ourselves. Now the message of Christmas comes on December 25th at the end of a long year where we fought and we struggled and we had our ups and we had our downs. And the message comes where Jesus says, here I am for you. I have come into the world for you. And long ago, I entered into Bethlehem and laid in a manger. And you are Bethlehem. And your hearts and souls are the manger in which I went, want to be born in and to live in, so that two may become one. This is the message for us of Christmas. And so when we connect with Christ, when we invite him into our lives, we receive truly his grace. And God's grace is like God's hand stretching down, reaching to us. And our response and our way of grasping that hand of grace is faith. This is how we commune with God, through his grace and our faith. St. Paul beautifully brought these two words together when he wrote in the Bible, by grace you are saved through faith. By grace you are saved through your faith. When God's hand of gra grace is grasped by our hand of faith, the result is salvation, connection, intimacy, union and wholeness. We see this divine human connection of hands, this merging of two lives, when we read in the Gospel of St. Matthew, as St. Peter saw the Lord Jesus walking on the water towards him, he said, Lord, if it is your will, command me to walk to you on the water. And the Lord responded, come. And Peter came out of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Christ's outstretched hand has always and continuously been available. In the Bible we see it and we know it in our lives. It was Christ's outstretched hand that reached out and took the hand of Jairus' daughter when she died as a 12-year-old and he raised her back to life. It was Christ's outstretched hand that gave sight to the man born blind. It was Christ's outstretched hand that blessed the few loaves and the fish and then thousands were fed. It was Christ's outstretched hands that were nailed to the cross. They are the hands of God that go to the extreme to show care and concern and love for his creation. Our existence would be worth it if we can just see Christ's hands, the hands of love personified. So, I want to close, my beloved, with this idea of faith. In the scripture, plenty of times when Jesus healed people, he said, go your way, your faith has made you well. It's the people's faith that brings about the miracles. God is saying, the more you believe, the more I can do for you. But if you don't believe, if you don't have faith, then I'm limited in what I can do. Our response to God's grace, our part in the story is faith. Now faith is a noun, but it's not simply a noun. It's also a verb. It's action. Faith needs to be expressed. Faith is a muscle. And the more you exercise a muscle, the bigger and stronger it gets. And the same thing with your faith in mine. We have to exercise it. We have to use that muscle. 
And so for us, whatever we need, we must have faith when we go to Christ and ask. It could be that the things that we've asked for, we haven't asked rightly, and we haven't asked with faith. We have to first want it, dream it, believe in it. In scripture, Noah had a dream of building an ark and had faith and it happened. Abraham had a dream of being the father of many nations and it happened through God's grace. Joseph dreamed of being a leader of all the people in the Old Testament and it happened. Nothing happens until you start dreaming. What is it that God is calling you to do? Where is your inspiration? What's your dream? Nothing begins until you start dreaming. And that dream requires now faith. Your dream should be so big that there's no way it will be accomplished without God's help. The saying goes, shoot for the moon, and then if you miss, at least you'll hit the stars. We need to dream big. We're thinking too small. We're thinking too locally. We're, we're thinking too minimally. And so this is for us the key thing, that we dream it, and now here comes our faith. Number one, we must invest our time, our money, our reputation, and our energy to our dream. You can't just have God do everything. You dream it, your faith shows when you invest in it, even your reputation and your energy. And number two, tr showing God that we trust Him, we have to let go of our security. We can't move in faith if we keep looking backwards. Like St. Peter, looking and feeling the wind and the waves, he began to sink. He and we need to keep our eyes on Christ. And we don't look back. We go forward. Abraham, to become the father of the chosen people, had to leave his homeland. And the Lord said, I'm going to take you to a new area. And God didn't tell him where. So now he's traveling, leaving what he's used to, in order now to go forward to what God wants. And this is the closing thought for us too. You and I will never grow until we come out of our comfort zone. We begin to grow when we come out of being comfortable in our own little homeland, in our own little box. God is calling us to something big and impactful. And so many of us maybe have not made that step because we haven't asked, because we haven't dreamed it, because our faith as a muscle might not be as strong as it could be. So this is now a new year for us where we're going to exercise our faith. We're going to invest our time and our treasure and our reputation and our energy to the things that God wants. And then from there, He will bless that which has His approval. So let's get comfortable this year, my beloved, with being uncomfortable. I don't like her. That's why I don't talk to her. And I don't go to her, his house. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And go in love and share and care. I don't like doing that. That's, my husband likes that. I don't, that's not my hobby. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's what love requires. That's what faith requires. So with those words, may God bless us with his abundant blessings for 2019. May we continue to grow as a person and as people, as a church here at this cathedral, a beacon that God has planted on the Upper East Side. God has plans for this cathedral when he planted it here in 1931. And it's incumbent upon us to continue to grow and offer these beautiful aspects that God has to offer to his world in and through us. So may God bless you. Merry Christmas and a blessed new year.